So welcome to today's edition of 22nd Century Management with Ken. I'm really fortunate to have with me a great guest. For those of you that are new to the channel, every week I do a live podcast on YouTube and I do it live on LinkedIn so you can find us in either place. Today I have with me, as I mentioned, David Barnett and his expertise is in helping small businesses. And it's interesting because he works both sides of the table, I guess you could say, because for 20 years, he's helped uh, small businesses with both with uh, selling their business and other businesses with buying businesses. So we're going to talk today about uh, what steps you need to take to sell your business. And David, you want to tell us a little more about your background? Yeah, sure. I'd love to, Ken. First of all, I, I just like to say that I'm one of those people who since childhood has always had an interest in business. And I was one of those kids that was always looking for enterprising new ways to make money around the neighborhood. And so grow up in, growing up in Canada, that involved shoveling a lot of snow and uh, doing things like that for my neighbors. And eventually into other things, uh, there was an opportunity when I was a kid back in the eighties where we had these catalogs and you could sell greeting cards and giftware and gift wrap and that kind of thing. And I developed a, a route through my neighborhood of people who would start to look forward to those catalogs and they'd place their order with me and I'd have to run over and collect the money. And then I'd have to work with my dad and consolidate, you know, the order onto a sheet and it would be sent off and we'd get a big box and I have to sort everything out uh -huh. as some of these direct sales things that people are doing today. And I was doing that when I was 12. And that was like one of the things that I was hustling to earn money with. I, eventually ended up going to business school. And I thought that going to business school was going to teach me how to be a businessman and only found out probably about three years in that what they were really teaching me was how to be a middle manager in a big company. And it really wasn't where my passion was. I was interested in the kinds of small and medium sized businesses that we see when we're driving around our cities, the businesses that you see along the road. And so when I got out of school, I was very fortunate, Ken, this was like the nineties, late nineties, I got a job as a sales representative with the yellow pages. And that's where my real education began because my job was to go and visit with the owners and managers of all of those businesses that I was interested in. And I got to sit down with them and find out how they made money. And more importantly, what kind of customers they were looking for, because I was going to try to help find those customers with the yellow pages. Eventually we all know with the internet and everything that the yellow pages was going to fall out of favor. So I left that. And I got into a business with a partner that I started. And after about a year and a half, we wanted to part ways from each other and we decided to sell the business. And that was the first time I'd been involved in a business transaction. I got into business financing after that. I've started to broker um, loans, leases, capital equipment, leases, factoring facilities, this kind of thing for small businesses. And during that time, I was approached by more and more people looking to borrow money to buy existing businesses. And that kind of drove me back towards that transaction I had done and, and this whole buying and selling of businesses. But the big thing for me was in 2008, 2009, Ken, the big financial crisis that occurred. What it did is it upset a lot of the companies that I was using as a source of capital for my loan brokering business. And I realized that I was going to have to make a pivot. And I saw the opportunity in helping people buy and sell businesses. I, I realized that the business broker function in my local town was just not well served. And so I joined up with one of these big international franchise brands for business brokerage. And that's what gave me access to the training. And so I spent two and a half years working under the wing of someone else while I went through and attended uh, different week long seminars and got my training and eventually earned a certification and became the owner of a business brokerage, sold 36 companies for other people while I did that. Um, but then I ended up leaving the industry just because the cash flow of business brokerage is really awful, Ken. Typically it can take a year or more to convince someone that you're the person to sell their business. And then once you've got that list, the, the quickest business I ever sold took me nine weeks from the time everything was prepared. And then we met the buyer and we did the deal in nine weeks. The longest one was a business I had for sale for three years. And I sold that business several times. I had deals on the table, buyers that were excited, and the deals fell apart for one reason or another. And that's the other frustrating thing about business brokerage is that you've got all these other players around the buyer and seller 
who have an opportunity to upset the deal. And so I left that at the end of 2011 and I went and I became a banker and a funny thing started to happen, Ken, my, my phone would ring and people would um, call me up and they'd been given my number by someone and they would call me and say, I'm trying to buy a business or I'm trying to sell a business. And this is what I'm trying to do. And I'm looking for someone to help me. And I started this little side hustle consulting business for myself where I was doing much of the same things that I did as a business broker, but I wasn't in any kind of agency relationship or working for a commission. I was just helping someone and billing them for the time and effort that I was putting into it. And it ended up blossoming into this whole new business as sometimes happens you know, in the world of business, you, you stumble across something and it ends up growing. And from that, I ended up writing several books on the topic. I ended up creating online courses. Now I'm on YouTube and I've got an audience there and it brings me consulting clients from all over the world. And I work with people as to your point earlier, either helping them through the process of buying a business or helping to analyze businesses and showing them why they shouldn't pursue the, a particular deal any further or working with people who have a business that want to sell and they're thinking about either selling now or they want some kind of help in getting ready to sell. I, I help those people as well. Very nice. And it's interesting because I sold a business and I did not do a very good job of doing it. I, I for lots of reasons, I, it did not work out well. I let them, I basically financed it myself and they decided they didn't want to pay me for it. And and the way it was, this company was structured, there was no way to afford, no affordable way, no profitable way to go after them and to get it. You know, and they were, let's just say they were smarter than I was and they were crooks and, and they got well, away with it. So you financed it entirely? They gave me, I got a little bit of cash up front and then they were supposed mm -hmm. to pay it out over a year. There wasn't okay. a lot of capital in the business. To that they needed to pay out and I was working for them. So I thought uh, that was all going to be okay. And then it wasn't, but that, that's neither here nor there, but that's one of the kinds of things that we need, you need, people need to think about is, okay, let's make sure that how I structure this is that I have real recourse. Cause I, I sold it to a corporation, which was just a sham, but I, I, my, I talked to several lawyers and they said, there's not a way to pierce the corporate veil and, 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 and do it in a way that you're going to get any money out of it. Mm -hmm. you know, you'll just spend it on legal fees. And I'm like, okay, never mind. But, and it's interesting because this goes to something that I have started talking to copier dealers and people that I work with about is that, and it goes to actually one of the principles in the seven habits is start with the end in mind. And, and I tell them that you should be working on your exit strategy now, even if you're not going to use it anytime in the near future. You should start working on what is your plan and start to structure your business. And I think that's a lot of what you share too. It is. And, and, and maybe we can get into some of that before we circle back around to talking about structuring deals. One, one of the commonly held misbeliefs among beliefs among business owners is that when they reach a point where they want to sell, that they'll be able to sell their business. And that isn't actually true. Your business is the thing that has to be prepared. for. So you could decide to sell your business, but if your business isn't prepared, you're going to have a really hard time selling it, or you're going to have to maybe agree to some things that you don't want to agree to. So one of those things can happen. And I'll sometimes get pushback from people who will say, I don't have time to work on getting my business ready for sale. And, and here's what I would say to those people is that the things that make a business ready for sale are things like systems, policies and procedures, being organized, being transparent in your bookkeeping and record keeping and, and all that kind of stuff. These things make your business more sellable, but it also makes your business, number one, more pleasant to operate, number two, easier to operate, and normally number three, more profitable. So even though you're not on the cusp of selling, you could end up enjoying a much more pleasant experience as a business owner and earn more money by investing the time and getting your business into a more sellable state. The fourth one, which is a stretch for some businesses, but the fourth one is if you do a really good job with this, Ken, you could actually end up in a position where you could 
have somebody step in and do a lot of your leadership functions and you could move into a state of semi-retirement or be doing certain things in the business, but doing them from someplace in Florida, for example, if you're in a colder state. And so the advantages to working on getting the business ready for sale are huge and really not only are going to end up to a better deal and a better price, but just make your whole experience more pleasant. It's interesting that in the um, copier industry, one of the key factors is locking in recurring revenue. Mm -hmm. And I spoke to somebody the other day and this gentleman, he was not tying his service contracts into his lease agreement. And I said, okay, you need to change that. And you need to make sure that you use five-year leases and that you that the lease includes the service payments. You don't want to pre-fund it, but you want to take that because you can take that to the bank, you can take that to to the market, and it adds to the value of your business. A, a contract that's not tied to a lease is really no worth no more than what's remaining on that current year of that contract. And it's things like that that too many people overlook. Yeah. There's a huge, there, there can be a huge difference in the valuation between a company that has recurring revenue versus one that's more of a one-off uh, revenue basis. When we look at small businesses, what we typically do is we look at the performance of what's going on in that business today. And the, the, that number, the cash flow that's being created, that number is going to determine the price. The next question that any buyer is going to have is they're going to say, will I be able to continue that cash flow under my stewardship once this seller leaves? Yeah. And so that immediately brings to mind the question of, are the customers going to stay? And if you have your customers in these contracts, for example, then you remove a lot of that hesitancy. People right. know that revenue is going to be there in a recurring fashion. And so the reasons not to do the deal start to fall away. The absolute extreme opposite end of this would be something like a construction company where they're constantly bidding on projects and chasing after deals. And in those businesses, the number of deals that have been signed for the coming year can have a huge impact on the price someone's willing to pay. Yeah, that uh, because that's revenue that's guaranteed for the next you know few years, however long the project's Exactly. But the buyer knows that once those jobs are done, it's going to be up to them entirely to go and find and bid those new projects. And, and this is what creates a little bit of anxiety, a little bit of doubt. Ah, I hadn't thought about that. And it's interesting too, because I had a customer that I supported for one of the manufacturers and the owner, his plan was he was going to leave the business to his son. I don't think they ever talked about that fact because the son was a whole lot more interested in starting a, a, a pizza place. And I think that was because there were lots of young waitresses there. <laughs> Neither of them were very good businessmen. And he had several opportunities to sell the business while it was viable. And mm. when he finally decided to sell it, the people that were interested said, why bother? Said, you don't have a business left. All of your customers are gone. We've taken most of of what made you worth anything is we already have that. We, we don't need you now. It's, it's interesting. I was sitting in on a presentation uh, from one of the industry groups that, that I follow, and they had some people in from one of these big websites, the business for sale websites, and they were giving a quarterly report on data that they had accumulated from the people trying to sell businesses and the, the people that they surveyed in the general business community. And one of the interesting factors, of course, with what happened in 2020, the lockdowns, the pandemic and all that kind of thing, it's thrown a wrench into a lot of people's aspirations. A lot of businesses have, have lowered performance because of that in hospitality and other industries. Some businesses have done better. But what was interesting is that there was this contingent of business owners who said that they had planned to sell their business, but they weren't going to because the business was working too well, meaning that they were benefiting in some way from all of this stuff that has changed. And it struck me as, as funny because if a business's performance is improving year over year, that's the time to sell because that's the time when you've got a great story that buyers are going to be interested in. You have a growth story and to hang on to it because you want to enjoy those profits and then 
later when things start to go into decline, you're going to somehow go to market. I can tell you if I've got a business for sale with years of declining revenue and sales, that's when you get into one of these circumstances where the terms aren't great. Buyers are motivated by that question. What is the cash flow and will it continue? And if you're showing declining cash flow year over year, then the question is what's going to make it stop? And if it's going to be my efforts to make it stop, why do I need to pay you for that? And I've had many sellers who will like promise, oh, this thing's going to change. This will improve. If you do this, this will happen. But again, why should a buyer pay you for work that they're going to have to do? They're going to pay you for the business that you deliver. So we want to make sure it's in as good a condition as possible. Yeah, I, I would agree 100% with that. Uh, so let me ask you, let's go back to, to the beginning. When do we think we should start planning to sell our business? When you start, if you start a business and you get to the point of being able to pay yourself a fair market wage for the work that you're doing. So if you get to the point where you're taking home the amount of money you would earn doing that kind of work for somebody else, now you're at the point where, yeah, you have a business, but I call it owning a job because you've got just that money. As soon as you hit that point, if you're going to do better than that, now you start to get into the space of actually owning a business because you're going to be earning the money that your labor is worth plus some profit over and above. When you hit that point, you have to start thinking about an exit. A lot of people, I hesitate to tell people, think about your exit before you start because some people will get into starting something and they'll never hit that and they might have to make several pivots to get to that point of having that cash flow and that profitability. Once you get there, then you have to start putting serious thought into what you're going to do to get out of this one day and who might be the ideal buyer if selling to someone else is your plan. Other strategies include hiring someone that is going to end up being the person that you sell to. There's all kinds of different ways to get out of business when, it's time, when you decide you want to leave, selling to a stranger actually is one that you can't control the timeline of. Believe me that well, I've had businesses for sale for three years trying to find a buyer. And right. so if you have a life plan of some kind where you say, I want to exit at a certain point in my life, there are other ways that you can initiate on your own that can help give you more control over that timeline. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, some specific things that, that, that you, you think about, you know, one that well, comes to mind is an ESOP, but. Finding a buyer within the business is one, but you can also determine who the ideal buyer is going to be and then work with that party on some kind of plan that you can influence the timeline on. The people who own businesses are often getting information, circulars, advertisements from business brokers. We don't have hard and fast numbers on the number of businesses that sell through brokers or not. But the best guess that I have based on talking to all kinds of different people in the industry is probably only about one in five sell with a broker. So the vast majority of businesses, <clears throat> excuse me, change hands. sorry, <clears throat> change hands without a broker. And so what does that mean? It means we're talking about family successions. We're talking about identifying buyers within the business or selling to someone else in the industry. And it, people will think of selling to a competitor. They'll think of a competitor in their own town. Oftentimes the competitor you have in town is not willing to pay you top dollar. And this is because they feel a certain entitlement to your clientele. Think about it. If you just close down, they would probably end up with a bunch of that business. And so while they might talk with you about buying your business, secretly, their hope is that it just explodes one day. Like it just closes for whatever reason. Yeah. And they can pick up some of those clients. The person who's most likely to value your business highly is someone in your exact same industry, but in another market. The next county over, the next town over, next state over. because they're trying to grow their business and they're facing their competitors. And one of the easiest ways for them to grow <clears throat> is to acquire a business like yours. And if it's in a whole new market, they instantly grow their revenue. And then they might realize some kind of advantages on the back end as far as their costs or overheads.
Sorry. No. Yeah, and, and it's interesting because we see that a lot in, in the industry that I work in, in the copier business. There are right now probably six or seven major companies that are playing Pac-Man. They're just running around gobbling up other companies and gobbling up other companies. And again, the, most of the cases, what they're looking for is the opportunity to expand into a new market. Mm -hmm. they, they're not typically buying competitors in the market they're already in because they figure they can run them out of business eventually because of their, as you mentioned, they start to leverage, you know, because when you combine two businesses, you can start to get rid of some overhead two different computer systems. You know, there's a lot of things that start to happen, some synergy that comes in. So that makes, it makes a big difference. And you can take, you can extend this idea of being acquired by someone in your industry pretty far. So here locally where I live, there was a great example through the nineties, there was a chain of uh, fitness gyms that opened up and there are these big national exercise companies out there that operate gyms all across the country. And so they approached one of these big national players and they said, would you like to acquire us? And the national player said, you're not big enough. We, we really are only interested if you have 25 locations. So what these guys did is they changed their corporate color or colors, their color scheme to match that of the business they thought would acquire them. They only started to use equipment that was the same equipment that the big national company was using. And they started to make themselves look and feel like that national company. And they expanded to 25 locations. And then they went back and talked with them again. And you can imagine it was very easy for that company to want to do a deal because they saw how they could just very quickly fold that business into their own. They didn't have to sell. The other company didn't have to buy, but they knew that it would make sense for these guys to buy them. And they tried to remove as many of the objections as they could to make it as easy as possible. I've seen the other thing too happen in the bottled water industry where a, somebody was setting up a bottled water company and they looked at the big national companies and they used the same kinds of equipment, the same kinds of delivery trucks, the same kinds of bottles, et cetera, so that they knew that when they went to shop their business around, it would be immediately attractive to that national player. Very nice. So, yeah. And again, it, it's just a, a matter of, of planning ahead, mm -hmm. you know, too many times, uh, and this is what I talk to dealers about. Right? This is that you're going to leave your business someday. It may be in a box, but you're going to leave your business. Hope and, not. <laughs> you know, well, you know, but what I'm saying is, is that everybody leaves their business at some point in time. And it's if true. you haven't prepared for it, what you leave behind is a mess. Yeah, absolutely. You know? And unfortunately, I mean, there have been cases where people have passed on while they were owning their business and without some kind of plan or even proper organization, oftentimes heirs are left scrambling, trying to figure out how to derive some sort of value out of that business. And sometimes they're not able to work that out and you end up just with a wind up of some kind and customers left in the lurch and competitors end up picking up all that business. Yeah. And, and I like what you said early on in our, in our discussion about the building structures and procedures and those kinds of things. That's one of the things that I talk to the service managers I train is that the key to being successful in service management is having procedures and things written out and, you know, and systems. Because you know, really a procedure is just a definition of a system that's in place. Because too many times I see service managers whose departments are almost chaos. They're getting today's jobs done, but there's no firefighting going on. There's nothing, nobody's working on the business. Everybody's working in the business rather than working on it. And I think that that is a challenge for a lot of business owners is you get sometimes so wrapped up in the process of trying to do what you need to do every day that you don't step back and do things like create business plans and create procedures. But those are the things that make life, as you mentioned, better and easier. I would challenge you with this thought. Every business has a system in place. It's just a question of whether or not it's in someone's head or it's actually written down or in a piece of software or some kind of. And so if there was no system, there would be no business because a business itself is simply a system of people doing their roles and tasks in order to create a positive cash flow, hopefully. 
And so the problem with systems being in people's heads means that they're not visible to other people. And you end up with a scenario of leadership or training through folklore. So if you can imagine yourself in a business where somebody tells you what to do and you do it, maybe you make a mistake, maybe you do an error and they correct you, they repeat the process again. Eventually you're going to learn that. So now the process is in your head too, but maybe there's some little aspect to that process that you haven't come across that you're unaware of that the other person knows that you don't. Part of the system now has just been lost in transferring from that person to you. And so this is where you get breakdowns over the course of time. Uh, if you can imagine any culture in the world that has a storytelling tradition, but didn't have written language, right? We hear stories of legendary creatures or, or characters. And we, and you can wonder, is the story we're hearing today, the same as it was told a thousand years ago. And in all likelihood it's not right. It's like this big, long game of telephone. And so yeah. by institutionalizing it, by writing it down, creating a system or a process that can be taught and referred to, what you're doing is you're, you're taking that, that point of weakness in the business away. And so one of the, one of the work things that I do with people too, is I've got, is I have a program called build a business that people will want to buy. And this is what we do. We work on the goals of the owner. Then we look at what kind of business is going to be able to facilitate those goals. Then we start talking about what the org structure of that business in the future would look like. And we build a whole plan for growth within the framework of who does what and what the different tasks and responsibilities are whole thing. What we often find when we go through that process is we will have these org charts of the business in the future. And they'll imagine if I do five times the sales at some point in the future, I'm going to have these different people. And then we'll say, what goes on in your business today that those people would do? There's nothing identified because they're not doing certain things in their business today that they know the future version of their business should be doing. And the reality yeah. is those are often the functions that prevent growth. I'll give you an example. I did this activity with a small business. They were in the sign making industry and they, I asked them, what is your target for the year? Well, they didn't have it. And then after speaking with them and looking at their financial statements, what we found out is that they tended to do about the same amount of business every year. And so then I was like, how do you know this is what business you're going to do? How do you know that you shouldn't be looking for more business, et cetera? Basically what was happening in this business is when they got close to year end, if they looked like they were going to hit the same numbers as the year before, everyone just relaxed and was like, oh, good. We're going to hit our number. We're going to be okay. But how are they going to grow the business if they're just trying to do what they did before? In a big company, what we have is something called a What's our budget for next year? What's the sales forecast, et cetera. And somebody has to be responsible for creating the budget so that everyone else knows what their part is and they can identify, do we need to find new customers? Do we need a new product? You know, whatever it is to hit these numbers. And so without that planning function, the business just can't grow because nobody's thinking about it. So in this process that I employ, we look at the future vision, we identify those things, and then we bring all of those tasks back to people that are in the business today so that there's at least one person that knows I'm responsible for those particular tasks. And now we know who is supposed to be creating the sales forecast. Now we can get the business unstuck and we can get the business to start growing and to have some sort of idea of where they're headed because we actually have people thinking about this stuff. Instead of what you described earlier, Ken, which is just people running around serving the customers all day. And then at the end of the day, do you want to work on this stuff? No, you want to turn on the television and crack a beer, right? That's mm -hmm. what people want to do because they're tired. And so it's about investing. When you talk with your retirement planner, they'll tell you, you put money in today and let it grow. Same thing with this stuff. You put time in today so that you save time in the future. It's exactly the same investment mentality. It's just with respect to time instead of money. But eventually it's going to mean more money and more time for you. And this is, this is the big difference between businesses that get themselves organized and start to grow 
There's been all kinds of retail stores open up in every little town, but only a few of them turn into Walmart. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and it's interesting because I, I use a little different analogy than you just used. I use a, I talk to my service managers about the difference between firefighting and fire prevention. Mm. And I make the point That's that if they spend idea. their lives fighting fires, it's not ever going to get any better. It's the fire prevention that starts to make things run better in their department and that they have to buy out the time to, to start m making changes. Again, I, the old adage, if you keep doing what you are doing, have been doing and expect different results, you, you got a problem here. Oh, it's, it's interesting. Well, you know what, David, I, I have really uh, enjoyed having it. Now, I do understand that you have something you're willing to give the audience. Yeah, absolutely. So I have this small ebook that I put together. It's the 12 things to do before you consider selling your business. And I, I think I shared a link with you, didn't I, Ken? You did. It's, that, in the, it's in the comments and in the description where people can claim it. Yeah. And feel free to help yourself to that. It's a quick read. There's 12 items in it. It's going to help you stop and take a quick look at your business from the perspective that a buyer might and help point out a lot of problems that you might have. And here's the thing. As we talked earlier about how a business needs to be prepared to be sold. Some of the things that you may be doing in your business today could take a couple of years to sort out, not just to fix the problem. You might be able to fix the problem tomorrow, but we have to fix the problem. And then we have to start to collect financial statements and results with the problem corrected, because that's going to be the numbers and the, the information that a potential buyer is going to look at when they're trying to figure out what's the business worth and will I be able to carry on the cash flow under my own stewardship. Yeah, no, that's a, a great gift for the audience. I appreciate that. Uh, we'll say goodbye to the audience and listen, everybody, it's been nice having you. If you're not subscribed to me, wherever you're hearing this, uh, please do. And yeah. uh, next week we're going to talk, actually, well, I, I forgot already, but oh no, we're gonna talk about uh, business structure is what we're gonna talk about next week. I have another great guest on, so we'll look forward to seeing everybody then. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me, Ken. And if anyone's interested in this stuff, davidcbarnett.com is my blog site. I've literally got hundreds of videos and articles just discussing buying, selling, and managing businesses. And I'd love for you to come over and share in some of that. Okay. Well, very nice. We'll see everybody next week.